Good morning and welcome to all of you to this service of the Bobby Branch Church of Christ. I saw quite a number of visitors come in this morning. If you're visiting with us today, we want you to know that we're especially glad that you're here and we would like you to visit with us whenever you have the opportunity to. If you are a visitor this morning, we would appreciate it if you would fill out one of the visitor's cards that you'll find in the rack in front of you. You may just leave that card on the seat and they'll be collected after this service that we might have a record of your visit with us this morning. We want to also welcome all of you who are joining us remotely this morning. I have two very good friends going back many, many years that I hope are watching right now. They live in the Waverly, Tennessee area over near Kentucky Lake. I won't say their names because I haven't checked with them if I could, but I'm happy to have them uh, tuning in with us this morning. After this service, we'll meet at 1015 for Bible classes. We do have Bible classes for all ages. Uh, if you need help uh, finding a class, just check with me or one of our members that, and we will help you to find your class. If you did not pick up a communion packet as you came in this morning, if you'll raise your hand at this time, one of our ushers will be glad to bring you a communion packet. We'll begin our announcements with our sick list uh, at home, Gabrielle. A visitation team four meets tonight after services in room one. Our summer series continues tonight with Don Blackwell speaking. I was handed a couple of notes this morning to announce there's a sign-up sheet on the bulletin board in the foyer for food to be provided for VBS. If you have any questions about that, you can see Maggie Hurst. And we are delighted to announce the marriage of DeAndre League and Taylor Mulliken, who were married at Gulf Shores, Alabama, Yesterday, surrounded by close family and friends. <coughs> the annual ice cream fellowship will be uh, next Sunday, July the 2nd, after our evening service. There's a sign-up sheet on the bulletin board in the lobby, and uh, when you sign that, please indicate what dessert you are bringing. There will be some seating available for that, but it might be a good idea if you would bring, uh, bring a folding chair if you can do that. A gospel meeting in Hiawassee uh, next Sunday, July the 2nd. Uh, the VBS in Red Hill in Manchester on Saturday, uh, yesterday, June the 24th. And uh, VBS starts today uh, at Leone and continues through Wednesday. Our youth news, there's a home devotional after services tonight at Caleb and Rachel Graves' home. The van will leave after, this, after the service tonight and return at uh, around 8.30 to 8.45. The Whitewater rafting trip will be on the Okoe River on Saturday, August the 5th. That will go from 8.30 in the morning until 7 o'clock at night. The cost will be $50 plus uh, supper. Uh, please uh, RSVP, RSVP no later than... Uh, Sunday, July the 9th. 
Today through next Saturday, coffee in uh, Rutherford County's week at Short Mountain Bible Camp. The scripture reading for this morning's lesson comes from 1 Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 9 and 10. Maybe we'd be standing for our first song, number 408. Father in prayer. Our Father, which art in heaven, we thank you for another day, but Father, we especially thank you for another Lord's Day. We thank you for the opportunity that you've given to us this morning, the freedom to assemble, and the freedom and the desire to study from your word, to sing praises to your name, and to offer our prayers unto you, Father. Father, this morning, as we gather together, we are most thankful for your Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ, for his life, his death, and his resurrection. We thank you, Father, for his sacrifice, that we may have a fulfilled plan of salvation, that through obedience, that we have the hope of inheriting a home in heaven with you one day. Father, this morning as we gather together, we are mindful of those who are unable to be with us and family members who are sick, perhaps at home or, or in hospital or nursing home. Father, this morning we especially pray for Gabriel Buford, for Margaret Schillinger, for W.C. and Nelma Chilton, for Greg Grizzle, 
for Willie Holmes, for Nancy Mayfield, for Susan Pryor, uh, for Anna Jean Bond, for Morris Griffith, Kathy Hennessy, Marty York, Ronnie Elrod. Father, for each of these and perhaps others that we are not aware, we pray, pray your blessings upon them. We pray that if it be thy will, you will return them to a normal walk of life. We likewise pray that you'll be with their families and help them and support them and their caregivers as well. Father, this morning our hearts are in grief and saddened at the loss of Sister Gauger. We pray, we thank you for her life and, and the opportunity that she had and that she took to be a faithful member and faithful to you, strong in the scripture. And Father, we, we pray that this morning that you'll be with her family. We pray that you'll be with us as a congregation as we feel the loss here as well, but especially for their family, her family this morning. Father, we pray that you'll be with them, not just for the day, but for the months and the weeks to come as they continue to go through their grief, but also with the understanding that we have a hope of joining her in heaven one day. Father, this morning we thank you also for Brother Tony and Brother Jason as they work with our congregation here. We pray that you'll continue to be with them and give them the wisdom and the courage to stand in the pulpit, to stand before class and preach and teach those things directly from your word. We pray, Father, that you'll be with their families and continue to bless them as well. Father, this morning we pray for our country. We know that our country often if not frequent, is not following you. They do not bring honor to your name and, and actually in contradiction to your word and, and your will. We pray, Father, for time. We pray to, for time to have the chance to redeem this country and the people in their, our country, our cities, our states. We pray, Father, for that time to be able to continue to spread the gospel and that you will help us with giving us the words and that you'll help us as we glean from your scripture the things that we should say and do to try to encourage and to educate and to, to help people to understand, to follow you, that there is only victory through you, victory over this life and in eternity. And Father, this morning also we pray for those men and women in our armed services, for those who are in our police and EMT and fire uh, all those that are standing in harm's way. And Father, we pray that you be with them, be with their families. If, you, if it be thy will, Father, also help protect them, help keep them from harm as they serve us and, and our community throughout this, this nation, throughout our world. Father, this, this morning, we thank you for our congregation here at Bobby Branch. We thank you for all the members who diligently always strive to serve to be kind, to be loving. And we pray that you'll always help us understand as we, again, as we study from your word, the love that your son had for us and that the love that we should have for one another, for everyone that we encounter and that we have always have the opportunity to spread the gospel, to teach the gospel, but also to edify and encourage one another. We know, Father, this life is difficult, but we know this life is brief. And so, Father, we pray that you'll be with us and help us to always be those loving Christians that we should be in following your word. We pray, Father, now that you'll go with us through the, through the service. We pray that all other things from our mind will be set aside and that we will concentrate on a worship that's holy in thy name. This is our prayer in Christ's name. Amen. Come before the offering this morning, 663, if you're using the book, 663. There is sunshine in my soul today.
commanded by the Apostle Paul on the first day of the week to lay by in store uh, a portion of what we've been blessed with. And the average citizen in this country is richer than any other country in this world. And so God loves a cheerful giver. Let's pray for the for the. Uh, I'm having a senior moment. The contribution. Heavenly Father, our merciful Lord, our Almighty God, we come before Thee thanking You for so many blessings that each one of us enjoys, and we pray that that we may generously and cheerfully give back to you a portion of what you've given to us so that the work of the church may abound. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Song of Invitation this morning is 337, if you'd like to mark it in your book. And now let us sing number 511 as we sing this. I would encourage you very much to... Notice carefully the lyrics of this song as we prepare to eat the Lord's Supper. Oh, we come to example we know in the scriptures that the early church met on the first day of the week to break bread and to have the Lord's Supper and we should remember Jesus every day but we're commanded to partake of the bread and the fruit of the vine the uh, first day of every week to help us to remember the sacrifice that Jesus went through, the humiliation, the torture, the agony, and finally his death on the cross. Let us go to God in prayer for, his, for this bread which represents the body of our Lord and Savior. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this remembrance. We thank you for for our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ who suffered so much for us and 
We pray as we partake of this bread that we may remember his body as it hung on the cross for us. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now, let us go to God in prayer for the fruit of the vine. Our Lord and our Father in heaven, we thank you again so much for your Son who died for us that we might live. And as we partake of this fruit of the vine, which to us by faith represents the blood of our Lord and Savior, may we remember his love and his sacrifice. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. This morning's reading is taken from 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 9 and 10. For what thanks can we render to God for you, for all the joy with which we rejoice for your sake before our God, night and day praying exceedingly that we may see your face and perfect what is lacking in your faith. The Apostle Paul loved the church at Thessalonica. He loved them so much that he wanted every opportunity available to be able to go and to see them once and again. And as I think about all the congregations that Paul established and all of those congregations with whom he had worked, the church at Thessalonica held a special place in his heart. He wrote two letters to this beautiful, wonderful, loving church, the book of 1 Thessalonians and 2 Thessalonians. And for four weeks now, we have been studying the book of 1 Thessalonians, and we will follow that with a study of 2 Thessalonians. But if you'll keep your Bibles open now to 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, we're going to study this part of Paul's letter to the church there. By way of introduction, I'd like to begin by asking the question, what is every parent's desire for their child? You know, a beautiful baby is born into this world, and does that mother and that father look upon the face of that beautiful child? What do they want for him? Well, first of all, I'd say most of us would say we want to know that they're healthy, that their body and their minds are physically developed and that they're going to be able to have a healthy life. I would say we also want to make sure that they're happy. We love to see smiles and laughter on our children's faces and to see the joy that is in their heart. But then as we begin to ponder the deeper things of life, we want to know that they're headed to heaven. We want to know that every child that is born in our family, every grandchild, every great-grandchild, has a desire that they will be with us and us with them in eternity with God. You see, if you read the book of 1 Thessalonians, Paul pictures himself as a parent. First as a mother, then as a father. He said, but we were gentle among you just as a nursing mother cherishes her own children. So affectionately longing for you, we were well pleased to impart to you not only the gospel of God, but also our own lives because you have become dear to us. Paul said, just like a loving mother loves that nursing child, he said, we love you. He said, we, you're dear to us. 
Then in verse 11, as you know how we exhorted, comforted, and charged every one of you as a father does his own children. So when Paul was looking at the church there, he looked at them as a parent would look to the child, and he wanted the best for them. In fact, the picture is here he wants them to be all that they possibly can be. Something that he could be proud of and say, that congregation is one that I started, and those are the people whom I love. Notice with me chapter 2, verses 19 and 20. For what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? Is it not even you at the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? For you are our glory and joy. Imagine Paul standing before God on the day of judgment, and as he gives account for all that he's done, the Lord says to him, Paul, what did you do for me? And he says, Lord, look at the church at Thessalonica while I worked with them. Look at the church as it got its start, and look at the church as it has grown. And he said, you will be our joy. You will be our crown of rejoicing. What a wonderful thought. Paul has toward this good church. Well, when you get to chapter 3, there's three things in this chapter that I think are valuable. The first one is verses 1 through 5 where Paul expresses his concern. He was really devoutly concerned about what would happen to the church there. Second of all will be his comfort that he enjoys with Timothy coming back to him and giving him a report. And then finally, verses 9 through 13 will be the completion, the maturing, the perfecting, if you will, of this good church. Let's begin our reading. Let's start with verses 1 through 5. Paul said, Therefore, when I could no longer endure it, I, we thought it good to be left in Athens alone. And send Timothy, our brother and minister of God and fellow laborer in Christ, to establish you and encourage you concerning your faith, that no one should be shaken by these afflictions. For you yourselves know that we were appointed for this. For in fact, we told you before when we were with you that we would suffer tribulation, just as it happened and just as you know. For this reason, when I could no longer endure it, I sent to know your faith, lest by some means the tempter had tempted you and our labor might be in vain. Will you listen to that last phrase that is in verse 5? He said, I was worried that the tempter might have tempted you, and all that we had done might be in vain. You see, Paul was left in a quandary. Quandary is when a person has a difficulty making up their mind, which is the best choice. And he wanted to know, do I need to be left alone here in the city of Athens, or do I need to send somebody back to see how the church is doing? You know, you can imagine here you might be and you have somebody in your family with you. Do you send them to go somewhere else and leave yourself alone? But at the same time, you're so concerned about what's happening. And Paul is in this quandary. And being in Athens alone was a tough place. When Luke records Paul's journey to Athens leaving this area here of Thessalonica, I want you to notice verse 15. So those who conducted Paul brought him to Athens and receiving command for Silas and Timothy to come to him with all speed, they departed. I want you to think about the way that Luke phrases this. To tell Timothy and Silas to come with all speed we would put it in our language today, hurry up, guys, I need you. It's a tough place here in Athens. It's a place filled with idols. These people here 
do not even know what they're worshiping or the God they're worshiping. And it's a big city and I need you. Paul said, here I am, I am in a quandary. So what he did, he decided to send Ta Timothy to establish you and encourage you concerning your faith. He said, we're concerned about these people. And so I'm going to send Timothy, Paul's son in the faith, the one that he could always depend upon, who had worked with him in that area. He said, I'm going to send Timothy. Why was he so concerned? Because of the tribulations, the persecution, the tempter. The devil was capable of taking people who were new converts and undermining them. In fact, new churches can be vulnerable. New Christians can be very vulnerable. I want you to go back with me to Acts 15 and verse 36. It says, then after some days, Paul said to Barnabas, let us go back and visit our brethren in every city where we have preached the word of the Lord and see how they're doing. You've got to imagine as Paul and Barnabas made that journey, you know, they began at Antioch and they go to the island of Cyprus and then they go up to Pamphylia. They go to Antioch, Lystra, and Derbe. And then they come their way back and he says, well, it's time for us to go back again. Let's see how they're doing. New converts need that concern for them. Are they going to make it? I can't tell you how many times that we've had folks visit us. Sometimes after a few studies, they'll become Christians. And then it's so often that people just drop them and they, they let them go on their own. But Paul was concerned that the church here might end up falling away. And so he says, I'm going to send Timothy. He's going to establish you, and he's going to encourage you to try to be faithful to the Lord. Paul was not only concerned about the brethren at Thessalonica, but that was his concern everywhere. When he wrote the Colossians, he said to them in chapter 2 and verse 1, For I want you to know what great conflict I have for you and for those in Laodicea, and as many as have not seen my faith in the flesh, I want you to know I care not only about the church at Thessalonica, but I even care about those churches with whom I've never even been present. Colossae and Laodicea, two churches in an area where Paul had served, but he had not been with those brethren. They had not seen his face in the flesh, but he was concerned about them. I think we need to be the kind of people who are concerned about the Lord's church, not only here at Bobby Branch, but we need to be concerned about the Lord's church in McMinnville and in Warren County and in Tennessee and in our country and in our world. You see what he is concerned is wherever he's at, he's remembering those good brethren and expressing that concern you see, concern will seek stability among God's people. We don't want this upheaval going on all the time. Listen to 2 Thessalonians 3, verse 15. He says, but the Lord is faithful who will establish you and guard you from the evil one. That word establish, make you strong. Like somebody who puts down deep roots that cannot be shaken. 1 Peter 5 and verse 10, But may the God of all grace who called us to eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after you have suffered a little while, perfect, establish, and strengthen and settle you. That's what we're looking for. 2 Peter 1 and verse 12, For this reason I will not be negligent to remind you of these things, though you know and are established in the present truth. Churches that are established, that are strong, that have that stability. That's what he was concerned for. But he also was concerned to provide some positive encouragement. Sometimes we need people to teach us to be strong and to, to sink deep roots. Sometimes we need somebody to pat us on the back and say, you can make it. I am with you. I'm here to help you. And that's what Paul was trying to do with Timothy as he sent him back. Look at Acts 13 and verse 43. 
And when the congregation had broken up, many of the Jews and devout proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas, who, speaking to them, persuaded them to continue in the grace of God. We talked about that last week in our Bible class. I want you to notice, he persuaded them to continue in the grace of God. We need to be the kind of people who are uplifting and encouraging our brethren. But the second thing I want you to notice with me as we look at verses 5 and 6, or 6 through 8, is the comfort that he took from Timothy. He says, but now that Timothy has come to us from you and brought us good news of your faith and love, and that you always have a good remembrance of us, greatly desiring to see us as we also to see you. Therefore, brethren, in all our affliction and distress, we were comforted concerning your faith, for now we live if you stand fast in the Lord. Oh, what encouraging words that Paul got from Timothy. He said, Timothy brought us good news of your faith and love. Paul was concerned, we saw that in the first five verses. He was concerned, but now when Timothy comes back to him, he says, Paul, you didn't need to be concerned about them. Their faith is strong. Their love for one another is enduring. They're good folks, Paul. No need to worry about them. He said in verse 7, he was comforted concerning your faith. Here you have a church that the devil is working just diligently to try to destroy the, the faith of these Christians. And when Timothy comes back, he says, Paul, he says, they're standing strong in what they believe. We taught them that Jesus was the Christ, and they believe that. They are standing strong as one body. You see, Timothy's Paul report to Paul set his mind at ease, just like it did with others. As you read through the letters that Paul wrote, you come to the one in Philippians in chapter 3 or chapter 2, verse 19, and he says, But I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you shortly, that I may be encouraged when I know your state. Now, I think back about what we began speaking of in our introduction about how Paul like a parent looked at these brethren and was concerned and let's put it like many of us would be you have children and maybe they're far off from you you've not seen them for a while and you hear message well how are they doing they're doing well are they healthy yes they're healthy are the kids doing well in school? Yes, they're doing well in school. Oh, good, I'm so glad to hear that. I'm encouraged by that. Paul was that way toward all the churches, but particularly toward the one at Thessalonica. Well, I'd like to ask the question, what would be reported about our state? If someone were reporting on the church at Bobby Branch to perhaps the Apostle Paul, or more importantly, reporting to the Lord about who we are and what we are and how we're doing things, what would that report be? Would it be encouraging? Would the report say, oh, that congregation is standing strong in the faith? Are they encouraged? Are they uplifted? Are they aggressive in trying to spread the gospel? Let me tell you, the church at Thessalonica was doing that, and we would do well to pattern ourselves after that same idea of serving the Lord. But now you get to that final section, verses 9 through 13, where Paul speaks about the completion. Read with me these few verses here. For what thanks can we to render to God for you all? For all the joy with which we rejoice for your sake before our God, night and day, praying exceedingly that we may see your face and perfect what is lacking in your faith. Now may the, our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus Christ 
direct our way to you. And may the Lord make you increase and abound in love to one another and all just as we do to you so that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all of his saints. You read that over and over again and you realize that there's something that Paul wants to finish. What does it mean to perfect their faith? Did you ponder that idea in your mind? What would it mean if someone says, we need to perfect your faith? The original word that is used here for perfect, I think it has a, a great meaning in several other passages. If you go with me to Mark chapter 1 and verse 19, there it is translated, when he had gone a little farther from there, he saw James, the brother of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who also were in the boat, Mending their nets. Perfect. Mending. Oh boy, that's a wonderful illustration. What does it mean to mend the nets? The nets got holes in them as they were worn. And as you mended your nets, you were closing up the holes. Do you realize there, there's areas of life where we need to be stitched up? where we need our faith to be, you know, that area, okay, the whole net is not broken, but there's, there's places where there's holes in it. Are there holes in your life? Or perhaps maybe better to say, are there holes in your faith? As Paul thinks about this. Or Luke chapter 6 and verse 40, he said, a disciple is not above his teacher, but everyone who is perfectly trained will be like his teacher. Well, there's the same word, perfect or perfectly. And the idea is completeness there. The fullness. There's nothing lacking in all of this. He's, he's perfectly in both quantity and quality trained like his teacher. But then another one that I think is perhaps valuable to see is it's also translated restore in Galatians 6 and verse 1. Brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. Restore such a one. There's something that's lacking. There's something that's missing. And what we want to do is to put it back like it is supposed to be. That brings another dimension all together itself, something that's been lacking here, something that needs to be put back right. And then Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 21, that he may make you complete in every good work to do his will, working what is well-pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. May you complete. You get to think about what is lacking in my faith. What is lacking in what I need? Well, what was lacking in their faith? Well, let me explore with you a few things that I think might be helpful. Because sometimes if we're lacking something, it may not be our fault. It may just be we haven't had time yet. First of all, they may have been deficient in their faith. And that's due sometimes to not having been taught yet. You know, if you find a child who's maybe in the second or third grade and would say, what's three times four? And they look up at us and they say, I don't know, I've not been taught multiplication yet. I'm not sure when they teach it now, but that's an illustration. It's something that a child needs to know they're deficient in but they've not been taught it yet. I look at the church at Thessalonica, and they're a new congregation. They've not been established a long time, and I think it's important to realize there's some things that they may not have learned yet. And Paul wants to complete their deficiency. 
Now, other times, the problem is we didn't learn it when we went through the first time. Listen as he writes the book of Hebrews in chapter 5, verses 12 and through verse 14. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God, and you come to need milk and not solid food, for everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. Solid food belongs to those who are of full age, even that is, those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. He said, by this time you ought to be teachers. There ought not to be a deficiency in your faith. Now we understand a child starts out, there's a deficiency there, but it's supposed to be there. In Mark, or Matthew 19 and verse 20, the young man said to him, all these things I have kept from my youth, what do I still lack? All of those commandments, worship the Lord God and him only shall you serve. Love your neighbor as yourself. You don't bear false witness. You don't steal. You don't commit adultery. I've kept those commandments. What do I still lack? Jesus said, if you want to be perfect, you want to be complete, go and sell what you have and give to the poor and come and follow me, and then you'll have treasure in heaven. This young man went away sorrowful because he's a man of great possessions. He understood, I need to do something, but he didn't understand what it was he was lacking. Sometimes for us, we need to realize there's areas in our lives where we're deficient in our faith. But second of all, sometimes what's lacking in our faith is something that is defective. I don't know if you've ever bought something that was defective. Maybe you bought a piece of equipment, an appliance. Maybe you bought a washing machine or maybe you bought a, a refrigerator and you took it home and you put all your food in it and it did not keep your food cold. Or maybe you put your clothes in your washer and it overflowed, and the uh, repairman comes, and he says, well, it had a defective part in it. You realize some people's faith is defective as well? And so how is it defective? Well, I can tell you one area, James chapter 2, verse 17, thus also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. Verse 20, but do you want to know, O oh foolish man, that faith without works is dead? There's a lot of people who say, I want you to know, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Okay? The devils believe and tremble. Well, I want you to know, I believe that the church is God's vehicle, its plan to save man. Okay, that's good. But what are you doing? You see... God's intent for your life may not be keeping the food cold and maybe not washing the clothes clean. And sometimes our faith is defective because it's not working. Number three, sometimes our faith needs perfecting, needs completing, needs mending because it's digressive. What that means is it's gone the wrong direction. Listen to 1 Timothy 4, verse 1. Now, the Spirit expressly says in the latter times that some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. People are going to depart and go another direction. Listen to chapter 6 of 1 Timothy, verses 20 and 21. O Timothy, guard what is committed to your trust, avoiding profane and idle babblings and contradictions what is falsely called knowledge. By professing it, some have strayed concerning the faith. Some have strayed concerning the faith. There's some people who have been taught correctly. In fact, maybe at some point were believing correctly. But now they've decided, I want to go my way or some other man's way. And in doing so, that faith needs to be corrected. 
It's almost like the mending of the nets or the restoring of one who's fallen away. But then a fourth area is developing. And a developing faith is one that is growing, one that is flourishing. You know, it's just thrilling to be a preacher. And you see little kids come up, and sometimes they're running around, they'll jump up and give you five, and you, you see them in their Bible classes and the smiles on their face, and you see them at vacation Bible school singing the songs, and then you see them become a Christian. And through their teenage years, you see them grow, and then they reach their 20s and the age of maturity, and they get married, and then they have children, and you see them teaching their children what they were taught, and you see the development that has taken place in their lives, and now that is also taking place in their children's lives. And that's the way it ought to be. In 2 Timothy 1, and, or 2 Thessalonians 1 and verse 3, we are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is fitting because your faith grows exceedingly. And the love of each, every one of you abounds toward each other. He said your faith is developing, it's growing, and it's encouraging to see that. Or if you want to take the classic passage from 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 5 through 8, but also for this very reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, to virtue knowledge, to knowledge self-control, to self-control perseverance, to perseverance godliness, to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness love. For if these things are yours and abound, you will be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. You start building and growing and developing. And Paul was wanting to provide that for the church at Thessalonica. Here's a reality of fact. No one of us has arrived at the point of perfect faith. Not one of us can say, look, here's where I am. I've reached the pinnacle and I'm, I'm done. There's nothing else for me to learn. There's nothing else for me to grow. Philippians 3.12, Paul would write, not that I have already attained or am already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. But brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. I'm pressing on. Oh, what a wonderful song we sing. I'm pressing on the upward way. For some, this is the time to begin the journey. It's interesting to have people in an audience like this. You recognize that there are people of all places along the spectrum of growing in faith. But there's some of not yet to start that growth. You've not yet become a child of God. You've not become obedient to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And if you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God, why not act upon that faith by repenting of your sins, confessing that you do believe that Jesus is the Christ, and then follow through with his command to be baptized for the remission of your sins. Doing that will add you to the Lord's church. That's when you really begin your journey. For others, it's a direction that must be corrected. You may be going in the wrong direction. And if you're deciding you're going to drive to Murfreesboro and you start out and you head going east, and you realize about the time you get to Rock Island, you say, you know what, I'm not going the right direction. Driving on to Sparta will not help you any at all. What you need to do is turn your life around. You need to make sure that things are right and you correct what is wrong. For others of us, it's a challenge to grow. Don't be content with where you are now spiritually. Don't think I don't have anything else to learn or any opportunity yet that I've not taken advantage of. God is calling us to be better, stronger, more faithful. 
Now, as you get to the end of chapter 3, I want to draw your attention again to verses 12 and 13. And may the Lord make you increase and abound in love to one another and to all just as we do to you, that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all of his saints at his coming. Let me ask you, are you ready for the Lord to come? Are you ready to meet him? If you're not a Christian, why not respond to the gospel this morning? If you're a Christian and your life is not right with God, why not get back on the right road? We're going to sing, Is Thy Heart Right With God? If you need to come, would you do as we stand and sing? One more time, we want to say thank you so much for being here this morning, especially if you're visiting with us. We thank you for being here and thankful that you chose Bobby Branch to come and worship God this morning. In just a few minutes, we'll have Bible classes that, that will begin and be over with at 11 o'clock. And then we'll have our evening service at 6 p.m. this evening, and we have our midweek Bible study at 7. So if you're still in our area, we encourage you to be with us anytime you can. We need to all remember next Sunday evening after services, the ice cream supper. Brother Joe called it an ice cream fellowship. If you eat as much as I do, you call it an ice cream supper. Amen. So... So let's all look forward to that and plan on being here for some good fellowship and enjoy each other's company and some ice cream. Yesterday, Tony and I went and visited with Brother Noel Pepper, and Noel stated to us that there were things that were amiss in his life and that he wanted to be forgiven of those things. So we had prayer with Brother Noel and asked God to forgive him, and Noel wanted the congregation to know about this. He said, if, if maybe my, by my example... It might cause someone else to think about their condition. So we appreciate Brother Noel very much for that. So now Brother Leonard is going to lead us in this final hymn and we'll be dismissed with a prayer. When the Savior calls, I will answer. When he calls. Somewhere.
our Heavenly Father, again, we thank Thee for the opportunity You've given us to come together, to worship Thee, to hear another lesson from Your divine will. As we separate from this assembly this morning, we ask You to be with us as we go into our classes, be with the teachers as they teach the things that they've prepared. And bring us back tonight to our summer series with Brother Don Blackwell. We pray for the continued success of this series. Forgive us of any sins that are in our lives, Father. Through these things we ask in your Son's holy name. Amen.